All that in the next hour with us for the first half of today's programme is Liz Peace, who's Chief Executive of the British Property Federation. Liz has battled her way through the storm all the way from Hampshire to make it here, and we're very grateful to you. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> now, first today, let's talk about the weather. Why not? Because you're lucky we're on air today if the rest of Westminster is anything to go by. Here's Whitehall, just before nine o'clock this morning. Not a mandarin in sight after that collapsed crane on the roof of the Cabinet Office. And it's not just Westminster that's faced stormy conditions. Tragically, two people have died as a result of the bad weather, both killed by falling trees. Over a quarter of a million homes are without power. Rail services across much of southern Britain have been cancelled and scores of homes have been flooded. Winds of 99 miles per hour were recorded at Needles Old Battery on the Isle of Wight. Weather forecasters say the storm is almost over in the UK. Earlier, the Prime Minister had this to say. Well, everyone has to act on the basis of the evidence that they're given and the information that they're given and uh, everyone's been working very closely together to deal with this storm. Obviously afterwards we'll be able to look back and see whether people made the right decisions. But right now what matters is listening to the evidence, working together and getting things back to normal. The Prime Minister talking about the storm. So Liz, you did make it here. How did you get here? Uh, well, um, I normally rely on South West trains and poor mm, old South West well. trains were absolutely <laughs> stuffed this morning. So um, what I did discover, never tried it before, their Twitter feed, which is absolutely first rate at keeping you uh, oh, right. up to date. 29 trees across the network with pictures, which was quite... Just so, to prove so, it. Yeah, just to prove it. Um, I woke up thinking, you know, what storm? So I was one of these sort of doubters, but uh, I realised as, you know, I found the rail network had collapsed, it probably was a storm. And I feel quite Sorry for these people who are trying to run infrastructure because they can't afford to take any risks. If they did take a risk, they ran a train sort of prematurely and something wrong uh, went wrong, they'd be absolutely pilloried. So I, I don't blame them for, for playing it safe. So we battled in by car, where by and large the roads were actually relatively quiet. Were they? And the winds weren't too high. We and can see pictures here, the storm hitting the coastline, obviously the high yes. waves, which I think have subsided to some extent. But as you say, the trees were the biggest problem for infrastructure. Yes, and, and on the roads, I mean, lots of lots of loose branches. But I suspect you know, the railways, they're sort of in cuttings. They, they have a lot of overhanging trees. So they sort of, <laughs> when you get a bit of wind, those are the things that come down. And I mean, the problem is, even if you predict the storm, you can't predict where the trees are going to fall. You can't have somebody standing around with a chainsaw along sort of hundreds of miles of, of train track. So I guess you just have to react when it happens and get the trees out of the way as quickly as possible. What about power? Because yesterday I listened to interviews from mm. energy companies or people certainly in the industry saying that they hoped there wouldn't be widespread loss of power. Yeah. And today it's 270,000 homes yes, without I mean, power. I, was, I mean, yeah. do you think more should be done and can be done to protect power lines, for example? Well, I think this is actually part of a, a sort of much broader infrastructure debate. And I know we're going to be coming on to that later. I mean, a lot of the infrastructure in the UK is extremely creaky. The more modern power power supplies are underground cables touch wood that, that's that's what we have and it's fine so I guess it's all about how you pay for this uh, replacement of infrastructure so that it will withstand things like this but on the whole we don't get extreme weather events all that often not compared with other places in the world so how so much money how it. much money are we prepared to spend to ensure against a, a, a one in 300 day event we're always compared to other countries who seem to cope better or so we always think do you think we do it badly when the bad weather? actually you know I don't think we do and I, I've chatted to a number of my friends in the States who all say uh, I was moaning about how badly our airports functioned and one of uh, my colleagues who comes from Chicago she said oh my god she said Chicago closes down when there's a bit of snow you know, oh, so it's all a myth I, I it's think all a myth, myth. <laughs> <laughs> now on Thursday MPs will vote again on the high-speed rail bill there's talk of a significant conservative rebellion and whilst Labour say they'll support the bill at this stage they're worried about the escalating costs so is there an alternative which would be better value for money well, in June, the Transport Secretary announced that the overall cost of HS2 would be higher than previously expected. The estimated maximum price has gone up from £34.2 billion to £42.6 billion, plus a further £7.5 billion for new trains. That has led Labour to question its support for the scheme. Shadow Chancellor Ed Balls says he's not prepared to write a blank cheque. And David Cameron said at the weekend that it might not go ahead without cross-party support. But now a new report for Network Rail has warned that the alternatives to a new high-speed line would have their own problems. 
Upgrading the east and west coast lines along with the Midlands main line would be expensive and would cause massive disruption. There would have to be weekend line closures for approximately 14 years whilst the work was done. Supporters of HS2 say this bolsters the case for the government plan. Well, we're joined now by Conservative MP Nadine Zahawi and from Luton, hopefully, by Labour's Kelvin Hopkins. Welcome to the programme, Nadine Zahawi. What do you think about these alternatives that have been outlined? There are alternatives then to HS2. Well, there are, but if you look at some of the details, and we'll get more this week, um, the pack job that you need to do would mean 14 years of weekend closures, journeys to Leeds, increasing by about two hours to four and a half hours, journeys from Huntingdon to Peterborough, doubling to an hour. Uh, you know, this is, there's no easy options, including Atkins and Network Rail saying that actually even the alternatives re require actually knocking down some homes. So, what you know, about the cost? We don't the, have the cost, cost it could be much cheaper. Well, they're talking about 20 billion. Last time, sort of West Coast Mainline was you know, effectively you know, patched up, cost about 7 billion. The 20 billion would only buy you about a third more capacity. The real issue here is capacity. You know, we've gone in the last 15 years up to about 125 million train journeys, which is a, 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 you know, a significant growth. And so we've got to make some hard choices, i.e., you know, we've got to go for more capacity. There is no one's arguing. This is where I find Labour's position really puzzling because you've got Lord Dyson, who delivered the Olympics, in charge now. He's just given an interview in the Politics magazine saying, you know, look, I, I know the numbers. I'm tight on the numbers. In fact, he's going further and saying, like with the Olympics, what UK firms can do to actually benefit from this investment, plus there's more investment in the rest of the uh, road and transport infrastructure, right. about 56 billion. So the, the arguments seem to be with Labour is, well, you know, let's see if we can make some political mileage out of this in the short term. I think that's very unwise we'll and wrong. Ask, we'll ask Labour, but let's have a look at the report, because is it really neutral? I mean, it was a government commissioned report um, by Network Rail, uh, and people will view it as homegrown mm. and scare tactics. Well, Atkins is a serious company that has an international reputation. I don't think they would put their name to a report, to a study of this kind, without them actually doing some of the work properly on this. Let's see the detail. All I can say to you is, you know, from previous experience of the upgrade on, on the West Coast Main Line, these things cost money and massive disruption. We're talking about 14 years of weekend disruption. If you take one train where you're going to have to provide, for example, bus service, one train of 500 passengers, about eight or nine coaches that you'd require, and you just imagine what that would do. But the disruption to, to, to is also absolutely huge. Of course, and that's why there is a trade-off here. That's why we've got to think about you know, what do we want, how do we want it. I think the north-south high-speed line is the right thing. It'll benefit eight of our uh, you know, most important cities. Of course, there are other parts of the country. By definition, when you have a new high-speed rail line, inward investment would follow that, that, you know, that, right. that transport upgrade, and you're going to get some winners and losers. But the winners in the West Midlands and in the North actually are much bigger than, 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 than the, you know, down in London in the South East. I mean, the government's going to publish its business case tomorrow. Why is so late? Why are we hearing all the arguments for H, um, the high-speed rail line so late in the day? Well, I, I think that Patrick McLaughlin has tried to do a rigorous job. He was right to say, look, you know, well, these massive, ambitious infrastructure projects, you're right to kick the tyres hard on them, but let's not sort of abuse the way we try and kick the tyres. Let's make sure that we have a debate that is constructive and objective so that we look at the, the data. And he's gone out of his way to make sure that the data is robust. Nobody's arguing against the capacity uh, argument that he makes on this, not even Labour. Labour have to decide whether they want to play sure. politics with this or actually behave in a responsible way and have cross-party consensus so we deliver this important let, infrastructure Let me project. ask, Elizabeth, are you a fan of the high-speed rail? Uh, I am a fan of additional capacity uh, and I think actually this is a case that so far has been very badly made. Everybody, I mean, the fact it's called high speed, you know, nobody's that fussed about knocking 10, 15, 20 minutes off the time to Birmingham. The important thing is that we have some new infrastructure. I was talking about creaky infrastructure mm. earlier. We can't go into the next 50 years with the same railway lines that we've got. We need some new ones. Now, to my mind, it does make sense if you're going to build new ones, you build them to state of the art. You don't build them to yesterday's technology. And I think if you actually look carefully at the numbers, you know, the, the incremental cost of moving to a high speed system as opposed to either patching up the old ones or building a completely new parallel one but to old technology is probably only about 10% difference. So, so in all, I think 
high, high speed two has, is the way to go, but I think we ought to change the name. And what about the, the cost? North and South? Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's that's, connecting that's, that's the North the rebranding. North. You can come up with the rebranding, the new yeah. name yeah. for it. Is it worth the money? Yes. Right, and alternatives that have been outlined today, for instance, upgrading the other three main so lines, wouldn't that be uh, a viable alternative to spending what well, would be depend, 50 billion? Well, it depends how you, measure, how you assess viability, but the idea of disrupting the travel over these services for well, however many weekends it was over over 14 <laughs> years, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it just beggars belief. You know, we, we, we like to think of ourselves as a leading modern country. We have fantastic technology. If we can't have an up-to-date railway system, you know, what are our, what's the rest of the world going to think But there is it? a risk it comes off the tracks. There, there is a risk that the whole project is derailed because politically, in your own party, there is a significant rump, perhaps up to 60 Conservative MPs, who are not going to back this on Thursday. What do you say to them? Well, I think the Prime Minister said the right thing. If there isn't cross-party support for this, and you know, the ball is firmly in Labour's sure. court. But let's talk if they about don't the support this, it, Of course it's difficult. It's difficult for many of my colleagues. Some of them you know, are in... in, in they're wrong. It, well, no, they're right to fight for their constituents and their constituency. They're right to, to make the arguments to say, look, have we done enough tunnelling? Have we done enough cutting? Have we made sure that the compensation is adequate and is delivered on time? People's homes are being but these are people's lives and properties. Let's make sure if we do it, we do it properly. They're make, ask, making all the right arguments. So I have, you know, no truck with my colleagues who are standing up and speaking up for their constituents. I would do exactly the same thing. But Labour need to make their mind up. Are, you, are we going to be ambitious in delivering these, these big infrastructure projects for the UK? You know, or are we going to say, we don't need that. We don't need better you know, airport infrastructure. We don't need shale gas. Let's just, you know, do none of that. Let's try and be, you know, something very different. Let's not fight to be the best, you know. Well, they would argue that because the best I think we're, tr we're trying to speak to them, but unfortunately the line, there are technical problems right. uh, with the line. Surprise, too. surprise. So, yeah. so well, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't get a Labour <laughs> spokesman on, uh, to come and, and actually talk about... Labour for the weather and the, and the line. No, 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 they're there. Right. It's just technical problems. Okay. Don't say I'll it's because, they, don't say it's because they won't come on. Um, but it, if you can't convince your own colleagues... Mm and obviously you just want to blame Labour, then the argument isn't strong enough, is it? No, if you, look, the, the estimates are between 30 and 60 colleagues who, who, who will decide to vote against this. You know, remember, there's over 306 of us in the Conservative Party, so the majority of colleagues think this is the right thing to do. It does need cross-party support. When you're going to go for such an ambitious project, it is important that there is support from the opposition. They have to make their mind up. Dighton, Lord Dighton, who delivered the Olympics, says he can deliver this within the envelope, which basically means within the budget, and he is probably the best man who is equipped to deliver such an ambitious project after the Olympics. Labour have to stop making sure, excuses made that and make their yeah. mind up. In terms, though, looking ahead, it's going to take an awful long time before it is actually online. By then, needs will have changed. Won't this new high-speed rail be redundant? I think it's very difficult to envisage a country in which we don't want good, uh, good rail sure, connections. Sure, but we could have done other and upgraded other connections. Will that particular I, line that shaves off just 20 minutes, will it really be the priority in whenever it comes online? But it's not this point about shaving off 20 minutes that's important. It's, it's, the important point is the capacity here. These lines are right. absolute, well, the, the single line that goes up, up to Manchester, you know, is, is bursting. It mm. frequently gets a problem on it. Once you've got a problem, you know, delays. Right? You need the capacity and I don't see how we can have a modern country without a modern railway. Even the well, Americans who've been sceptical about this are going for high speed. Your wish has been answered because we now have Kelvin Hopkins, a Labour MP. We've sorted out that technical problem. Well done. Thank you for joining us. You may or may not have been able to hear what Nadim Zahawi was saying, but he is pushing the ball firmly in Labour's court, saying without cross-party support, then HS2 Hello? is derailed. Hello. Yes, sir. I've lost you, I'm afraid. Oh, can you not hear me now? I can hear you now, but it yeah. was breaking up. All right, well, yeah, I'll um, try. We'll try and persist. What is Labour going to do? Are you going to support, should the party support the line? Well, I've, my, I've come here to support GB Freight Route, which is our freight route scheme, which would take freight off the, the north-south main lines and uh, five million lorry loads off the roads as well each year um, and uh, free up those lines for, for more passenger. I think on West Coast Main Line, my engineer friends tell me that modern, modernised signalling, if we get more, 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 uh, more freight route, more passenger route through, more passenger frequency through, uh, and uh, the other lines are, more, are easily modifiable in, in relatively short time as well. Right, but Kelvin Hopkins, the report here clearly says that actually any alternative to HS2 is actually not all it's cracked up to be. You would have 2,770 weekend closures lasting 14 years and there would still be billions in terms of cost of the upgrades. It wouldn't be... Well, I think that's nonsense. That, that's, well, that's, which that's bit's just nonsense? That's a scare story, isn't it? 
Well, because East Coast Main Line can be modernised without interrupting traffic at all. We want to build a, a, another viaduct at Wellin, um, a flyover at, um, at Peterborough and another one at Newark, um, and uh, it, it, increasing the line from two and three track to four track between Huntingdon and Peterborough. That's what needs to be done. Then we can get um, 140 mile an hour working for most of the route and do London to Glasgow in a shorter time, London to Edinburgh, sorry, in a shorter time than is proposed for ATS2. So do you want and are you lobbying Ed Miliband and Ed Balls to withdraw support from this scheme? Uh, well, I, I'm just expressing a view. I'm not lobbying them about that. What I am lobbying about is GB freight route, which is a dedicated freight route right, from yes. the Channel Tunnel to Glasgow, but linking what's your all the main conurbations. What's your problem with HS2? Well, it's just that I, I, I think it is unnecessary and extremely expensive, uh, and would not, and the money would be much better sp spent investing in all sorts of other railway projects, including GB freight route uh, and modernising the East Coast, uh, West Coast, and Midland Main lines, and indeed promoting another line from Paddington to Birmingham to take take extra capacity, make extra capacity in that route. Right, well, Nadine Zahari, it's just a scare tactic. All this stuff, this report today, saying that you would have to spend perhaps equal amounts of money and have all that disruption when you can just upgrade all these lines without HS2. Well, Kelvin just talked about Huntington to Peterborough. That would double in terms of time to an hour to get there while these, these upgrades are taking place. You're talking about a spend of about 20 billion, according to a serious firm, Atkins and Network Rail, uh, to get a third of the capacity, which doesn't address the problem. We've already begun investment. You've got the Manchester to Scotland line being electrified. You've got the London to Cardiff line being electrified. We're spending an additional 56 billion on top of the 17 billion that will be spent from 2015 to 2021 on HS2. 56 billion on other transport upgrades. So this idea that you could spend right. more money differently, I think is wrong. I think Labour need to put up a better spokesman and come and actually explain why they are, you know, effectively okay. casting a shadow over a very important project for business, hard-working business me well, men and women around the country. We're watching your programme and thinking, why are Labour doing this? All right, well, Kelvin Hopkins said he wasn't uh, lobbying them. That's his view. But thank you both very much. Well done, Kelvin Hopkins, for finally getting onto the programme. Now, now, it's becoming harder and harder to get on the property ladder in London. In the past year alone, house prices in the capital increased by almost 9%, and many are blaming foreign investors for pricing ordinary families out of the housing market. Overseas buyers see London real estate as a safe place to invest their cash, at a time when safe assets are becoming increasingly rare. So are foreign investors to blame for house price inflation? And if so, what should be done about it? Eleanor Garnier has been investigating. This is luxury living. High ceilings, a touch of marble, plumped to perfection. London properties like this are a place for the world's millionaires to move their money and make more. A safe investment in a turbulent economic world. And it's turning property in our capital into a global reserve currency. Uh, so we just bought this house on Glebe Place in Chelsea onto the market at £6.75 million. Had we been marketing the property a year ago, we probably would have been asking closer to six million, perhaps 6.25 million pounds. Uh, the reason for that is that we've seen prices grow in the area by around 7%. It's a familiar story across the capital in all areas of the market. Latest figures from the Office for National Statistics show that in the year to August, house prices in the capital shot up by 8.7%. One agency has recently reported that asking prices went up by more than 10% in a month. It's fueling fears of a housing bubble and making London increasingly unaffordable for many. High level of international interest. Some agents report over 50% of purchases coming from overseas with their affordability being greater than the domestic buyer, that's obviously pushing up prices. So the choice for the domestic buyer is either move further out or really stretch their levels of borrowing to levels that really aren't sustainable. It's not just the influence of foreign buyers and the influx of immigrants that's sucking up supply. There are many factors. Our strong cultural desire to own homes rather than rent, more people living alone and the help to buy scheme are all cited. Close to the capital in the southeast, the ripple effect is being felt. Elsewhere, across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, house prices are rising, albeit far more slowly. In Scotland, they're falling. London's Mayor Boris Johnson welcomes overseas investment. He believes the solution to high prices and short supply is to build more. 
But there's pressure on politicians for radical steps to help average income earners. We need restrictions on foreign capital coming in, as they have in Singapore, Hong Kong, Switzerland, many other countries. And we need to make sure that council tax is much more applicable compared to how much house prices actually are. Because a mansion in Kensington and Chelsea paying less council tax than an ordinary four-bed house in Stoke-upon-Trent, that's just not acceptable. New homes are springing up across the capital skyline. The concern, though, is they're serving the appetite of rich investors rather than helping to meet the drastic shortage of affordable housing. And the shadow housing minister, Emma Reynolds, is here. Welcome to the programme, Emma. This piece, first of all, is foreign ownership to blame for the recent house price inflation? It probably is contributing, but actually I don't think in the end it's something that we are going to be able to curb or limit. Because the problem is, if you didn't have this foreign investment, a lot of these schemes wouldn't even get off the ground. So we would just be building even less than we do at the moment. And in fact, I think a lot of this foreign investment is far more of an issue in central, the very centre of London and in the sort of uber prime. Uh, rather than sort of some of the... the Although the isn't it having a ripple one. effect in that sense, that it's pushing the prices to the outer London boroughs as well as the inner London boroughs? I'm not sure we've got a clear, clear enough evidence for that. I mean, the, the, the obsession with London is very much in the centre for the, for the overseas buyers. I think there are other things that are actually driving, driving up house prices elsewhere, you know, lack of supply, um, you know, the help to buy scheme up to, uh, up to a point. I mean, I think it's a very complex picture. I think it's very, it's too quick and simple to say, blame the overseas buyers, do something to curb them. Although in that film, one of the contributors said 50% of interest in homes in central London, certainly over the sort of 2 million mark, came from overseas. So the anecdotal evidence is there, isn't it? But, but that's actually not going to hugely affect the first time buyer, like my younger son who's looking for a house. He's not looking for a 2 million pound, a, a 2 million pound flat. He's looking for a much more sort of reasonable level. And, and interestingly, some of these overseas buyers, about 49%, I think, of the over 1 million pound properties go to overseas buyers. 28% of those people, uh, only 28% of them are non-resident in London. So they may be foreign buyers, but they're actually in London. But you do accept the analysis that for ordinary families, is it's extremely difficult to buy a home in either centre or outer London I and they're being pushed I out. I absolutely accept that and we have to look at ways of making that easier. Do you want to take action against foreign investors? I think there is growing concern about foreign investment and foreign ownership. I think particularly when flats or houses are being built and in some cases, not all cases as Liz has said, but in some cases being left empty mm -hmm. and there is a chronic shortage of supply in London but across the country and that is the really big issue that the government has failed to tackle. There's a chronic shortage of supply, supply is outstripping demand uh, and therefore house prices are going up. Right now we understand what the problem is to some extent although how many of these properties are being left empty that have been bought up by foreign investment or by foreign money and are left empty? Well, I think estimates vary so I do think we need a more accurate assessment of the facts in terms of how many properties are being left empty. I mean, Liz said you can't curb it. You can curb it, though, can't you? You could, if you wanted to, introduce taxes or levies on foreign investors. Would you like to do that? Well, firstly, in terms of the empty properties, which I think is a problem, and but as, as I say, we've got to understand the percentage of the problem that, that's caused by that. But councils already have the power to increase the rate of council taxes on these empty properties. And Camden Council, for example, uh, earlier this year, asked the Secretary of State, Eric Pickles, whether they could increase that council tax even further for empty properties. So empty properties and some of those are owned by foreign investors is a particular problem in some areas of London. Is that a good idea? Well, first of all, I agree with Emma, we, we're not absolutely clear how many are empty. I suspect it is rather less than, than people think. We um, were involved in some work back in 2007 by a, a, a reputable independent researcher who said he actually felt this, that all this business about lots of empty properties was a bit of a fallacy. Very few, something like 5% were empty. We need would to redo like to that. See, would you like to see boroughs and councils? What, what I would like to see, and I think it would be fairer for everybody, is some changes to the upper ends of council tax. Uh, I think this is, this is actually a sensible way of getting getting the right level of tax levied on the higher, more expensive properties. I mean, is it fair that somebody living in an inner London borough like Kensington is paying less council tax than someone living in Stoke-on-Trent? It's obviously not fair. So should the councils carry out, should there now be a rebanding exercise? 
look, in an ideal world, you'd have a rebounding exercise. In the ideal world that we're not living in, and we're not living in an ideal world, the problem is that it costs a lot of money to revalue properties. And you'd have to do it across the country, and it wouldn't be up to councils, because councils are seeing very, very large cuts to the government grant that they get. So it would so have to be... going to continue, then? Well, I mean, we all have to look at that nearer the time of the general election and in terms of, of the budget that we put forward to the, you know, in terms of what we've got in the pot. But all I'm saying to you is it would be great if we could do that, but it is a costly exercise. Is there something that we could do like a mansion tax that wouldn't require uh, all it the... Would require, that, would, that would still require a rebanding, wouldn't but it? Only at the, else, because only, otherwise you've got properties that have not been looked at for years and years. and are sitting sure, but only at, the upper, only at the upper end. I mean, my constituency is in Wolverhampton, sure. and I would wager that there isn't a house in Wolverhampton that is over two, two million pounds uh, in terms of its worth. Right. I mean, property speculation tax, that's the other thing. Uh, that's my, been... my, my concern with this is that if you, you, you take a sort of quick leap, a sort of knee-jerk reaction into some sort of mansion tax, property speculation, tax, something that's specifically aimed at overseas buyers, which I think would be very difficult because a lot very of those wealthy people are, you know, or, or even wealthy homegrown, that, that you will you will actually simply drive away a whole load of the investment, certainly in central London. Do you think London. that would really happen? Yeah, ab absolutely I do. If we, if, we don't, if we don't have a degree of overseas investment in a lot of these large schemes, they won't even get off the table. Because the problem is, when the companies are looking at whether to do them, they have to do their investment appraisal. They have to assess how many they're going to sell at what price. The fact that they can pre-sell off plan a percentage of them is what allows them to get the finance, which allows them to crack on with the scheme. If they can't do that, they won't I do it. I'm not, I'm sorry, but I'm not convinced by that. Obviously, uh, developers and house builders are driven by profit, the highest profit uh, available. The problem is, I think that this government has relaxed the so-called Section 106 uh, agreements with councils, which means that councils can no longer demand a high percentage or a, a substantial but amount of house building to be... Investors are actually bringing the money to build these um, developments in the first place. Well, look, demand is outstripping supply in London. So why is it that um, there are developers who are sitting on land and with planning permission and not building houses. Even Boris Johnson has said this is a problem. I think that is one of the problems we need to look at and I'm not convinced um, that, that foreign owners need to All come right. in to, to boost the Let to me let Liz supply. answer that finally. Yeah, well I think the developers sitting on land and not using it, again I think that's something I'd like to see some evidence of. I think you'll find there are parts of the, the, the sort of house building community that wouldn't, wouldn't be averse to seeing something done to tackle that. But at the end of the day you can't make somebody build out a scheme if they're actually going to lose money on it. You know, the, the, these are businesses, they do their investment appraisal, they've got to be absolutely clear that they are going to be able to sell and they're going to be able to make a profit. Nothing wrong with that, because if they can't make a profit, they're not going to be in business. Emma Reynolds, thank you very much. And to you for being our guest of the day. My I pleasure. hope the journey home isn't thank as you. horrendous <laughs> as the journey in. Thank you.